Hi, welcome once again. We're in this weird Zoom world. Um, I'm Rebecca Bloom Rothman, the director of Tempe Public Art. And thanks for joining us for Public Art Insights. Uh, tonight, we're going to talk about interviewing, which is always anxiety <laughs> inducing for everyone involved. Um, even us who get to watch the process, but it doesn't necessarily have to be that way. And there's some um, pretty straightforward tips that our presenter is going to share with you today. So before I go forward with um, our overview, why don't we all introduce ourselves? And I'm looking at little boxes on a screen. I know you all are. Um, so I'm going to point out, Mary, do you want to go first? Sure. I'm Mary Shindell, and um, I'm an artist, and I do both public art and studio art. Christine? Hi, everyone. I'm Christine Beatty. I'm a public arts assistant with the city of Tempe, and I work with Sophia and Rebecca. And Sophia? Hi, everyone. I'm Sophia Lotta. I am a public art specialist for the uh, city of Tempe with Rebecca and Christine. Again, thanks for joining us, Public Art Insights. Um, we at Tempe Public Art have been working with a number of really wonderful artists and we get a lot of calls from artists who are interested in getting into public art about just the ins and outs. And so this is a series that we've put together and we'll continue to do these to help share some um, insights from artists who have managed to work outside the studio and in the public realm for a while. Um, briefly, I assume because you're here tonight that you know a little bit about our program. We work on all things in the built environment out in the city of Tempe. So that includes neighborhood projects, uh, built environment projects, temporary projects. Anytime you see something that looks a little bit different, a little unique, and is a landmark work of art, that is largely due to the public art program. Um, if it's on city property, there's a lot of really wonderful grassroots pieces in Tempe. We're fortunate to have such a creative community that wants to be involved. Um, so from time to time, we get asked about projects and we have to say, you know, it's a great project. We didn't do that one, um, but we're always here to help and help guide people through finding out the information about the pieces themselves. Um, there are a couple different ways that we work in public art. Uh, one is what we know as CIP, Capital Improvement Projects. That's how the city builds itself with an artist involved. For example, the McClintock underpass that Zach Valant finished recently. Um, another is we work with private developers and architects and the city planning department on art and private development, like this piece by Elon Averbach. Um, and those are privately commissioned and privately owned, but we still help facilitate the process from the city side. And then neighborhood projects, we work with HOAs and neighborhood associations and our neighborhood services program, as well as artists to create those wonderful little gems throughout Tempe's neighborhoods. Um, one recent CIP project was at Estrada Park and um, through a competitive process, artist Mary Shindell received this commission. The park was uh, being built in such a way that they were making room for a new fire station in South Tempe. And out of an eight acre park, one acre was going to be part of the fire station, which gave the city the opportunity to rethink the park itself and reconfigure it and work with residents to say, what would you like in your neighborhood park? Um, and something that came up time and time again was art. So we were able to work with the parks department, residents, and the fire station to make sure that the art was integrated. And one of the things that we noted when Mary came in to interview is she really spoke to her experience in parks. She spoke to the panel in a way that they identified with her. They understood where she was coming from, both as an artist, but also as a community member. Um, and she knew kind of the fabric of the people coming in and out of the park, what they'd be looking for. And because of her interview skills and her ability to really identify with and work with a selection panel, we thought, who better than to talk about how to give a <laughs> interview than artist Mary Shindell. 
And um, I will say that I've had the privilege of working with Mary for many years and she definitely looks at each site individually. And every time I've seen her interview, she connects with a panel in such a way that they hear her, they listen, they understand, and she listens to them. Um, so don't be shy, ask her questions because she's got lots of answers. <laughs> and with that, um, I'm gonna let her take over here. Okay, um, I'm gonna be talking to you about interviewing, which is definitely the hardest part of public art. <laughs> and it's something that um, you sort of get used to, but you have to understand that in public art, just as if you were an actor, um, you would be constantly looking for your next um, project. So you would be constantly interviewing. Um, so basically, the way I introduce myself is very simply, people, when they're listening to you talk about art, they know that they're supposed to be looking at something. So you wanna give them something to look at fairly quickly. Uh, make a really concise self-introduction, um, or if the person in charge of the meeting has introduced you, then you can, and some, like we um, did today, everyone would introduce themselves and then just make this as simple as you can, like nice to meet you all. Um, it's not a good time at this point in the interview process to list, to list your background or credentials. Um, I've seen people do it and it just seems to slow things up. If you can just get into your slide presentation and you can mention your, your background and your credentials if you like while you're showing your work. You always, in the whole interview process, the most important thing is to make your artwork your primary concern. And in that sense, you are communicating directly with your best platform as an artist, your images. And I think that's a good way for people to connect with you. So I'm gonna show you some studio art. This is um, a piece that I did with, that was not directly done for public art. This is a piece of studio art and it's a drawing with pen and ink and Prismacolor. And I did this when Mars was in opposition to the Earth and they launched um, one of the rovers. They just recently launched another one because Mars is very close right now. And so you can see it at night. It's, it's very clear in the sky and it's very red. So I drew Mars into this piece and then um, I added a little bit of red and the Saguaro bird hole to connect with Mars. But basically I was getting into um, doing just the texture of the saguaro. And I thought it was, it had a really great architecture and design to it. So the next slide you see is actually me using the saguaro pattern and texture. This is my first public art project and it's called Saguaro Flowers. It's at Adam Diaz um, Senior Center in West Phoenix. And what you're looking at is the entrance you see a very large uh, white saguaro flower. And then what you're looking at to break up the floor into panels are those same patterns that I used in the drawing of the saguaro. So they're rib patterns and um, needle bud patterns. The round red marks are where you would see needles in a saguaro. So if you can take something you know, that is understandable to you and place it in a situation like this and explain it to people, um, they understand. They understand it very easily. And, and um, it's almost surprising sometimes because you're kind of, we're used to talking to other artists. We're not used to talking to the public that doesn't have an art background. But this, using your studio art as a way to explain what you're going to do in public art, I think is a good, it's, it gives you a good start. This is a drawing of the same floor um, on the floor plan. And at the bottom, you'll see samples of terrazzo. I wanted to be able to, I did the first drawing in Prismacolor with pen and ink and did it by hand. 
And then later, as I was learning to draw an illustrator, I decided I needed to redraw some of these older drawings so that I had a, a record of them that was going to be able to be viewed online or in a different format. And using even scans of hand colored drawings is not quite as crisp as it is if you can use a digital drawing. So I went back to my old hand drawings and I was learning to draw an illustrator anyway. So I just redid them so that I could have a record of them. And then I wanted to also include record of the colors that I used. So this was, I did this for myself, but it helped me to figure out ways to present these kind of things. If you're going to use hand drawings, I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, use them on, in a high resolution scan. Um, a cell phone photograph of a hand drawing is just never looks good in a slide unless you're really, really good at Photoshop. But it's um, much better if you can either scan them on a scanner or if you can do them digitally. This is um, the entrance to Goodyear Community Park and the title of this piece is Air, Earth and Water. So Goodyear was founded by the Goodyear um, Tire Company in, as a place that the, you can, they could grow cotton so that they used the cotton in the tires for the airplanes in World War I and these tires and this name of Goodyear stayed with the city but the kind of cotton that they used was Egyptian cotton. And actually they had two cities that they did this in. One was Okatillo and one was Goodyear. And they used to call Okatillo Egypt, Arizona for a while. So I used Egyptian symbols in this and um, symbols for some of the things that went on in the park. And this is a roundabout where people drop their children off to play sports. And they'd also come through here to drop off picnic supplies and things like that. So it's low so that when you're in your car, you see the piece of artwork as you're going around the, the um, circle drive. This is um, called The Memory of a Tree is Strong. And this is about, this is in Mesa on Country Club in Maine, and it's covering up a traction power substation, which is a large transformer the size of a three-car garage that's just a really ugly steel building. And Valley Metro decided, actually, when they were putting in um, the Northwest Extension, that instead of having those buildings just sitting there on the street, they would put artwork on them. So this was the first one that um, got built that I did. And it's in a neighborhood where there used to be pecan groves. The Pomeroy family in Mesa planted pecan groves all along Main Street on the north and the south side. And interestingly, um, you can still see some of the old trees. And if you see a drone shot of the neighborhood, you can see them in their grove formation. It's really quite interesting. And they're, um, they're large, beautiful trees. And, I grew up in the area, so I knew about them just from looking at them, but I wasn't that familiar with the history of them. But a community member came up to me and told me that she had one in her yard and that the last one on the south side of Main Street had died and they had to take it out. But the ones on the north side were all, a lot of them are still living. You can um, actually see some of them on a street called McDonald in Mesa. So this is a screen to cover up the power station. The um, object of this piece of art is to let people who may want to get in there be able to see that there's nothing interesting in there, nothing that they would want. And, but yet to put something on the outside that view is uh, something to look at and is, is more or less beautiful. So the idea is not to just fence it away so that no one can see it, but to sort of have that kind of interaction where they can see just enough to know it's boring. Um, this piece is also kind of interesting because it's so large that when you drive by it, the front screen that faces the street, which is on the left in the picture, kind of merges with the, the screens on the um, east side and you, can, you get a lot of movement as you walk through it. 
or as you drive past it. This piece is called Bougainvillea. It's another traction powered substation. This piece is um, in a neighborhood that unlike the one in Mesa where you, there was a Taco Bell right next to it and a restaurant on the other side, it was mostly business, business type neighborhood. This was a purely residential neighborhood, um, 19th Avenue up north of Northern. And they wanted to make the traction power station more or less be the scale of a house and set it on the lot so that it started out being back on the lot and ended up being very close. As you can see, she's walking on the sidewalk right in front of it. But this piece is meant to um, pull in the bougainvillea, which is a very predominant plant in that neighborhood. Um, and I have been in the neighborhood quite a bit because I have family that live there. And I always noticed that people took great care with their yards and seem to be, you know, have a lot of pride in them. So I wanted to use something from the neighborhood and I used the bougainvillea plant. And it surprised me in a way when this project was finished that the neighborhood has such a strong attachment to it. They um, actually use it when they advertise their 19 North neighborhood events like farmers markets and things like that. So that, when I figured that out, I was like, oh, this is like really what public art is supposed to do. It's, it's really supposed to connect the neighborhood to the site and, and in that respect, make it merge and become a part of the neighborhood. I like transit and you can probably notice that. Um, <laughs> it's interesting to me mainly because so many people use the site. I like parks also for this very same reason. So this is Estrada in South Tempe. And this is a litho mosaic piece. I did, I think eight panels of litho mosaic in the sidewalk. There's a um, fitness trail that goes around the park. And so we located spots that it would be um, an interesting place to put these panels and they reflect the plants that are planted in the park. So I worked with the landscape architects to decide which plants to use and which plants they were using. And what you're seeing here is a creosote flower with bougainvillea. So they were using desert plants kinds that we used to just, you know, they would yank out of parks. They use, they use them um, actually in the landscape along with things like bougainvillea and red yucca and things that you're most used to seeing. But I found that really interesting. Um, so I also used the same idea when I did the safety surface of using the plants and the tree leaves that are in the neighborhood or in the in the park. So this is a desert marigold and you're seeing some pistache leaves and different things like that. There was about 8,000 square feet of safety surface in the park. So I had to figure out how to be able to make the objects in the design a size where people could know what they were when they were right on top of them. In other words, I didn't want people to be walking on some big, you know, large color area and not be able to tell what it, what it was. Because like I said, the, the neighborhood, this neighborhood was very um, involved also in the, they, the fire station was going in. At first they didn't want the fire station, but then when the city decided to redo the park, the neighbors were very excited about that. And um, I just, I wanted, the playgrounds and these exercise areas to be something that would interest them over the long term and would appeal to all of them. So you have children playing here, you have people who are watching their children under the shade screens, and that's an important demographic in a park. Not everybody there is running and walking and exercising or playing on the playground equipment. A lot of people who attend parks are watching their children. So I needed to, I feel like it's always best if you can appeal to every, every um, person that's going to be around in the area, using the area. 
So this is a piece of studio art. And as you can see, it looks fragile and it is fairly fragile. It's actually made out of um, cast plexiglass. It's, um, it's got a styrene insert in it, which is a digital drawing that is printed on the styrene. And then I roll it up, slide it into the tube and drill holes and put fiber optics in it. So it's a very uh, sort of light, fragile looking thing, which when you look at it, you might think this could never be public art because actually someone once told me that good public art is, uh, is art that can be power washed. And that is very true. You do want something that's so durable that to clean it and care for it just involves something like power washing. So I, I like to do these kind of pieces, but I always thought, well, maybe there's no way to ever put them in public art. But this is a, this is Glendale City Hall. And this is a temporary art project as a part of the Influx um, series. And this is something that I would encourage all of you to apply for if you've never done any temporary public art. It's pieces that are different than durable public art. And I just really like doing them because it gives me a chance to use things like LED lights and um, fiber optics and plastic. You can't really use the kind of plastic that I like to use in a durable public art situation. And glass is another thing that's very difficult to use in public art. So that kind of transparency, I can, um, I can get that and use that in a temporary situation. So basically, I sort of save those kind of projects for something like this. This is called Blooming. And it's about the saguaros blooming and they bloom when it's very hot. So when I would talk to people who would look at my artwork, collectors or people who were in a museum setting, and they would ask me what kind of flower it was that I had drawn. And I would say saguaro flowers. And so many of them would say, oh, I've never seen them. And I realized they're gone. The tourists are all gone by the time that these flowers bloom. So I did this project to kind of show that these flowers bloom for those of us who are sturdy enough to be here all through the heat, which this year was a great test of our will and power. <laughs> so let's talk about the kinds of interviews that there are. Basically, there are two types of interviews. The first type is a finalist proposal presentation interview, and these are the most common kinds of interviews. So this is where, I don't know if you um, may have attended one of the other workshops about putting together a proposal, but this is a, an interview that specifically addresses your single proposal that you're making. And it's a good kind of interview to start with because you are able to offer your ideas in a very focused presentation format. And it gives you a chance to talk about what you were thinking of when you did it, why you did it certain ways. I will generally, if it's a project with what say one piece is being proposed, I will generally show some, some of the drawings that I did to get to that point or some of the things that influenced me. Maybe they involve the site or maybe they involve um, imagery that I would like to use in it before I will show those sort of things also before I show sort of the final product. But generally you will only do these kind of projects or these kind of presentations for one project. Occasionally you might be asked to draw for three different sites. Um, in that case, you have a chance to present three different ideas. I would say if you're doing an interview like this to Try to make all of your proposals look like you did them. Don't try to make something that looks really different just for the sake of having something different. Do something that's definitely um, has evidence of your hand in it. Um, but 
occasionally you ask, they'll ask for more than one, but generally just one in a proposal presentation. A finalist um, basic qualification interview is a little bit more difficult in a way because they're going to basically ask you to present images that illustrate your ability as it relates to a specific project. So say the project is a, um, a park, then what you're going to want to show them is, is work that you've done from your portfolio, previous work that could be possibly relate to a park or whatever the project is. So in this type of interview, you don't have to have a proposal, but it totally hinges on your past experience. Some Times you will have to use studio work. Um, I still do on this kind of an interview because some of the questions that I've been asked in these kind of situations are, um, have you ever done a pass through space? And I have used installation images of very fragile pieces to show just that I could place things in an environment so that people could move through them. Um, can you deal with a large site? I will always show Estrada for that because it was an eight, eight acre park with a lot of art in it and all of the art in the ground plane. So basically um, you just pull from your past experience. And another question that you'll be asked, no matter at what level, if you're just starting public art or if you've been in it a while, I'm often asked, how do you deal with fabricators? How do you work with architects, engineers, water jet cutters, and all those sort of things? And it's helpful if you can show this project. I will generally like show the Mesa screen because it was quite um, an intricate water jet cut screen. It took a lot of work by me and by the water jet cutter to get it right. So basically, you will show something. If you haven't done any public art, you have probably done something that you can use in this thing. I used to use um, printmaking because occasionally I would uh, work with other printmakers. Any collaboration that you've done with other artists, you can start by using that before, you know, if you don't have anything where you've actually fabricated. Okay, um, so we're gonna talk about you as an artist in the interview. First of all, your images are so important. If you have good images, it gives you the confidence to, um, I don't know, to kind of stand up there and, and talk about your work. So try to get your images just like you want them before you turn in your PowerPoint so that you know what's coming next and you're able to describe it and you're confident that it looks good. Always have good images. I've said that before, you can't say it too much. I used to hear it all the time from everyone, get good photographs or have good drawings. It is critical. And if you are in an interview and you're doing something that's like tile or something like terrazzo or even cut metal, things like that, you can bring samples and pass them around and give people something to hold on and look and look at because a lot of people don't understand what terrazzo is or what color body tile is or you know the difference between certain kinds of paint even you can bring paint samples the um with the zoom interviews that's harder you have to although i still think it's important in fact i just finished making a tile sample that will be passed around to people on a panel ahead of a Zoom interview, just because I clearly couldn't describe it in a way that they could understand otherwise. Then the other thing is um, your image is important. You've probably heard the saying of dressing for the job you want, not the job you have. At this point, you are probably a studio artist, but if you show up, in your studio work clothing, it doesn't always imply that you're interested in or capable of meeting and interacting with the public. 
choose comfortable clothing, like a loose jacket, jeans. Um, it doesn't have to be dressy. And it, it's, there's so much um, clothing that you can, you know, mix and match with other things. And, and it doesn't have to be expensive. It doesn't have to be dressy, but it needs to be comfortable. You want to look like you came to, uh, you came with respect for what you were doing in this interview, you came with respect for the public, for your artwork and for getting it out into the public. Also another thing, um, in-person interviewers usually give you a choice as to where you want to stand when you present or if you want to stand or if you want to sit. And think about that ahead of time. Think about it and practice both ways and feel, you know, figure out which feels most comfortable to you. I'm fairly short, so I figured out over time that the best thing for me is to stand. Um, because when I sit at a table, I have a tendency to, you know, look down and <laughs> sort of slink and try to disappear. But if I stand up, I can't do that. So you need to figure out how you're going to present yourself. Um, remote interviews mean you need to consider the background and the lighting. I like to use what I'm using right now, which is my studio, because I feel like if I use my studio, that's the part of the interview that can say, yes, I'm an artist and I may, you know, be presenting a project and I, and I want you to know that I can talk to the public, but at the same time, I want you to have the feel that I am a working artist. So a lot of people use different backgrounds. You can choose whatever you like, but basically the other thing you need to do on a Zoom call or a, a Zoom interview is ahead of time do a tech check just to make sure that everything's working. Um, I've had over the, over the quarantine, I've had to learn Teams. I've had to learn web something and Zoom and all these different ones. And so just be sure everything's working. If you have the opportunity to show your proposal to family members or friends with your computer, do that ahead of time because that will really help you get it figured out. Preferably show it to people who are not necessarily of an art background, but people who would be like the people in the public that you may meet in the future if you're given the commission. Okay, so the panelists. The panelists are representing the public and in many cases, what happens is they have to answer to the public for the choices that they make in selecting an artist. So you maybe will have one artist on the panel and maybe an arts administrator, but the majority of the panelists will be stakeholders of one sort or another. So they may be neighborhood people or they may be people who work in the building where the artwork is going. They can be anything from judges to police to all sorts of different um, jobs that people have in cities and municipalities, transit, but they have an interest in what's going in with the artwork. So you have to think of convincing this diverse group of people that you are someone who will be able to explain your ideas to members of a neighborhood group and not just to artists and art professionals. Public art, public art also involves bringing people along, which is a phrase you'll hear a lot as you go into public art. People who are not happy about changes to their environment, like um, rail stations or fire stations or Sometimes even something like a roundabout can get people all upset. Um, it's very important. This is a really, really important role for the artist. So the interview is where you're showcasing your art in the same way. You're showing the panelists that you have the enthusiasm to bring the panelists along, as well as to bring the public along when you're presenting to the public. And the artist who can explain their artwork in a straightforward manner will always have an advantage over someone who is, you know, having trouble explaining their art so that lay people or community people can understand it. So this is a um, 
a piece of studio art that I did called Agave and Furling. And it's a digital drawing. And I've used this image in a couple of different public art projects. Even though I did it as a studio piece, it's um, something that I was able to adapt out. And I have actually printed on, um, it on plexiglass and made it into three-dimensional sculpture. And then most recently, I actually did something I never thought I would do, which is a mural. And I would never um, apply for mural public art jobs because I just felt like it, it wasn't something that I had ever done. So maybe I should leave that to the muralists. And then I started thinking about it and I was thinking, well, everything that I do in public art is pretty much something that I've never done. The consistency in my public art always revolves around the fact that there is drawing involved. So I decided to apply for this project because it was the connector under the 202 between the Rio Salado and Riverview Park in Mesa. And I was familiar with the park situation in Mesa because I grew up there. And so when I went to look at the site, I walked down into the tunnel. And as I walked into the tunnel, it got really cool under there. And I thought, this is like a swimming pool. It's just like when you are really hot and you walk into the water of a swimming pool and you cool off immediately. And so I decided, wow, it's like, this would be great. It could be a swimming pool. So I did it to honor Rendezvous Pool, which was a pool in Mesa that was just this very large pool where everyone learned to swim. And I put the tile as a marker on the walls so that you got the idea that it was a pool, a swimming pool. And then I did on the south side, which is, this is the south entrance. You can see the hummingbirds that you saw on the previous slide. And then I also use migratory birds, such as the people who come here in the winter. And a lot of them do stay in the East Valley because of the ballpark. The ballpark is Sloan Park for the Cubs. Rendezvous Pool was at Rendezvous Park. And that's where the Cubs first played their spring training ga games way back. So because there was baseball here and because it was a park, I decided to connect the idea of Rendezvous Park with Riverview Park. So the title of this piece is Rendezvous Riverview. And it has orange blossoms and imagery from Mesa on this side. On the other side, it has mesquite trees and egrets and animals and plants from the wilder side where the Rio Salado is. And I think that's just about it. Hopefully I'm on time. <laughs> You are on time. Yay. Yeah, thank you, Mary. Mm -hmm. um, so I think if you want to open it up, we can, I've got a few slides just in closing, but um, we can take some questions. And then as a reminder, we did record this and we will record it. Um, if I know I tend to be the kind of person who has to ruminate on things. And sometimes after I attend a presentation, I have a question in my mind. And I think, oh, why didn't I ask that? We have all of our emails listed here. Um, so you can think of it later and email us, although we'd love to have a conversation now. Also, as a reminder that this is the third public art insight that we've put together. And we will be doing more of these, but we wanna hear from artists in the Valley to see um, what kind of topics we, you know, we've got all kinds of ideas, but we wanna hear from you artists and residents about what kind of topics um, you would like to have us cover. So think about it. And if something comes to mind, please reach out. We're here to help. Um, so I, uh, I guess we'll put our emails in the chat so that we can get to questions. Look at each other's faces now. <laughs> Wonderful. We have a couple questions on their way in. And again, if anyone wants to jump in and ask, they can or continue to type them into the chat. And so Mary, first question comes from Susan Conclu. And she asks, when were when you were newer in public art, how many average submittals did you do annually? And how many now that you are experienced? 
Um, when I was new to public art, I probably only did um, say five or six a year. And because I was, uh, I was pr being pretty cautious, I wasn't, you know, sure what my capabilities were. And there were things that I just wouldn't apply for because they seemed like they were beyond my capabilities. But now I probably, I must do, I would say between 20 and 30 a year. That's what you just always have to be getting your work out there. And the other thing is, even if, even if you only want to do a few things, the main thing is every time you apply, every time you interview, you're getting your work out there. And that's the most important thing. And you're learning how to do it better and better all the time. Thank you. Another co question comes in asking what medium the Bougainvillea piece is. Um, the Bougainvillea piece is actually in Terrazzo. Um, it was, it went through several variables along the way and it was supposed to actually be cemented, cementus throughout. So I'm gonna bore you with what it is. It's plastic, it's a polyurethane. It is not holding up like it's supposed to. So basically that piece is going to, and this is just a part of public art, that piece is going to be redone with the same design in enameled steel in a couple of years, just so it will have more durability. Um, the thing was, is that the neighborhood likes it so much. I didn't, I didn't want to redesign it because it had become such a part of the neighborhood. So I asked Valley Metro if we could find out if it could be done in enameled steel and look just like it does. Only it will have a different surface, but yes, that's an exterior vertical terrazzo I don't recommend doing. <laughs> Good to know, thank you. Uh -huh. All right, a couple more questions. So do you relate your materials that you use to the community? Yes, I usually do. Um, I usually try to figure out in, in the sense that is this a question about do I tell them about them or do I try to make them the materials work with what's in the community? I generally do both. I do look at like a neighborhood and I think what fits with this? What would look good here? And if you notice, I've done all sorts of different things because every site is different. Every site demands something a little bit different. So I look at the neighborhood and try to figure out, you know, what sorts of things would look nice with that neighborhood, uh, whether it's tile or whether it's water jet cut steel, paint, anything like that. Okay. Oh, and the questions keep coming. Lots of people are eager <laughs> to know about you and your process. So how do you get your ideas flowing once you are selected for a project? And what is your typical process? Well, um, typically, I try to visit the site a lot. Um, I try to be really aware of what's around the site. And that will generally influence me. Or if I have a chance, like if panelists are, are really open about talking about their, if it's neighbor, a neighborhood or uh, people who work in a public building, if, they have a, if I have a chance to hear them talk about what it is that's meaningful to them, I will use that. Um, for instance, the pecan trees purely came out of a community meeting and oftentimes my ideas come out of, of what's already at the site or what people are talking about on the site. But basically uh, that is the second to the scariest thing about public art is when you get to commission and then you have to come up with an idea and you're like, oh my gosh. And it's, it is somewhat terrifying. But at the same time, that kind of terror makes you really think hard and try to do something that you have a lot of people depending on you. You know, you have a lot of people who are going to see it. So it makes you, it kind of helps to focus, helps you focus. <laughs> so basically, yes, I, I use community input and the site more than anything else. That's great. 
Oh, a couple more coming in. Okay, did do you set up the community meetings? Which, no. Okay. Yeah, I don't um, generally do that. Like someone like Rebecca would do the community meetings, a uh, public art administrator, they will orchestrate those kinds of things and, and those kinds of situations. And it just depends on what the project is. So for the park, we had a community meeting um, that ended up being very small, but the people that were there were very engaged, which is great. Sometimes for larger projects, like a Valley Metro project, you may have uh, a room full of people. Um, I'm involved in the Northwest Extension too, which is the bridge over the I-17. That community meeting was probably a hundred people. And I was the only artist able to make it to the meeting. So that was very interesting, but I did get a lot of input. And um, so it worked out really well, but it's, it's never set up by the artist. Little casual things, like if you're at the site, someone might come up to you and ask you what you're doing and you can say, well, I'm here because I'm the artist. And, and that happened at Glendale City Hall. The policeman who was sitting the lobby asked me what I was doing and I said, I'm getting ready to put art in the lobby. He said, yeah. don't cover up the windows because if someone's coming in the door with a weapon, I like to know ahead of time. So. You know, some of your information you get one-on-one, -on -one, but most of it in community meetings. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And I, think I can interject a little and say that sometimes, um, or there are times where there's a group of stakeholders or residents that might be really, really um, engaged or interested or connected, in which case we'll have the formal community meeting and somebody on our end or whoever is running the project will put it together, but then we might give a list of those stakeholders or that group to the artist and let the artist have, if there's specific questions or something and they need to, you know, wanna have a, I know some artists like to have coffee in the neighborhood or go and meet with people to talk to them about the neighborhood one-on-one -on -one outside the community meeting. And those kind of meetings you might do. Yeah. And that does lead into Xiao Marine's question, which is if a community does not respond to your talking points in an interview, do you have any words of wisdom to sway the point of view and the conversation flow? Um, I, I have had experiences where the community just doesn't like the project. And you know, basically going in that there isn't much you can do, but I don't, I don't give up. I just, <laughs> I go in there and I, I battle for the art as best I can. And, you know, I've had people come up to me afterwards and say, well, I hate this project, but I really like your work. And um, I think the best thing to do is to let people like Rebecca, and I hate to throw this on her, but the public art managers they will deflect this you know kind of uh non-engagement or kind of rejection of a an art project they can deflect that better than the artist so as the artist i stick completely to the art i talk about how wonderful the art is how much i want to put it there you know that i feel very strongly that this will improve their neighborhood um and these sort of things but i i that's all I, I just try to be very, very positive and enthusiastic about it. And that's about all you can do as an artist. And, and I, I would say it, that's a good point. Like it's, that's where the collaboration between the artist and the program manager or project manager comes in because you really have to, you really have to work together. You've got to do that. Um, that tag team conversation with the community. And so the question that I I would, you know, when people are like, well, I, I just don't like this or why is it blue and not pink or whatever it is. Um, then it becomes a conversation about, you know, what is at the heart of what you don't like about it? You know, what what is it about this piece that is disturbing? It's gonna be in your, you know, 
is it just personal taste or is it about the site? And those are the kinds of things that we can get into the process and take it off the artist's plate because at the end of the day, it's really about the artist's vision and um, how he, she, they got selected. And that's one of the reasons why the interview is so important because the selection panel should represent that community. Thank you. All right, and I don't see any new questions coming. I did wanna reflect, Susan had also mentioned, thank you for answering their questions and also mentioned that they worry about their brain having some creative block. Do you have any tips for a creative block during the process and how you work through that when you have people relying on you to get a project done? Basically what I do, um, I, I feel like the best way for me to get rid of a creative block or to move past it is to draw. So even if I don't have an idea, I'll look at the site, I'll look at the scale and my computer, I'll set up uh, a file with the size of the object in it. And then I will start with basically um, the mass and the size of the project and I'll just start drawing and I sort of draw my way out of trouble most of the time. Um, it's just, I think it's kind of, that's kind of what drawing is for me as a way to understand the world. It's also a way to understand an art project for me. And so if I'm having problems, I will, I will try to work on them. I am not the kind of person that will walk away and go, well, it's better if I don't think about it. That does work well for some people, but not for me. For me, I have to doggedly <laughs> go after it until I solve it. <laughs> so, and, and understand that when you're doing a public art project, it can go through several iterations. In other words, your first thing that you draw, it might be okay to get you through, say the first 30% of the design. And then things start happening. Um, engineering things, scale things, you know, all different kinds of things that you have to adapt to. So that method of working your way through it plays out all the way through the project as you may have to change things. So for me, um, I think that's the best advice I can give is to just start working on it, keep working on it, show your project manager what you're doing so that they have an idea of what you're doing. And if you're headed in the wrong direction, it will generally, you know, say, well, and I've had um, this happen where people have said, well, you know, what people like about your work is, and, you know, it's like, yes, I'm possibly trying to be too different than um, what people come to expect for you, from you. So basically, you just, I just draw through it. I just keep drawing and drawing <laughs> until something happens. <laughs> I think draw your way out of trouble is a pretty <laughs> <laughs> exactly what it is. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I don't see any new questions coming in, but I'll give it a second. Feel free to type in any last minute questions to the chat. <laughs> And if you're having a creative block, email them to us later. We can also share them with Mary if you like. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, well, thanks to all for spending an hour with us on uh, your Thursday evening. I know it's, it's uh, the end of the day and I'm sure everybody's had a full one at this point but we certainly appreciate the participation.